Hello and welcome to this panel on central bank digital currencies and the international monetary system. Today's discussion is a part of the New Economy Forum Fintech Exchange, a series of events in the run-up to the IMF's annual meetings 2021. In this panel, we will be discussing potential implications of the emergence of central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs as we call them, on the international monetary and financial system. I'm joined by three distinguished experts, Marcus Brunemeyer from Princeton University, Nihan Arula from the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Huyun Song Shin from the Bank of International Settlements. And thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we might be on the cusp of a revolution in the global financial and monetary system. This is due to the advent of digital money. CBDCs are a new form of central bank money accessible to the public. It may be the new frontier in the evolution of the international monetary and financial system. And the IMF aims to inform the policy debate through independent analysis. We also advise countries and help them evaluate policies relating to CBDCs. This summer, we published a policy paper representing the IMF strategy to step up surveillance and capacity development work related to digital money and strengthen the analytical foundations in this area. In all these efforts, we engage and collaborate closely with other international institutions, standard setters, the academic community, and other stakeholders. The distinguished panel we have assembled here is a case in point. The three panelists bring together different but complementary perspectives. They have all made important contributions to our thinking about these complex issues. And our conversation today is structured to discuss two interrelated topics. The first is whether cross-border availability of CBDCs, whether they would improve the stability of the international monetary and financial system. As you can imagine, this is critical for the fund. And the second topic is whether CBDCs will lead to a reconfiguration of international currencies and the global financial safety net. So we will start with the first topic, basically the implications of C CBDCs on the stability of the global monetary and financial system. For emerging market economies and developing countries, especially those with weaker fundamental and policy records, there's a concern that CBDCs would further exacerbate currency substitution, limit the policy space, and potentially increase the likelihood of currency runs or runs on the domestic financial systems. And capital flows are fundamental, of course, for the global transfer of savings towards productive investments, but they can also be subject to excessive volatility. So it's extremely important to understand what impact CBDCs could have on capital flows and on their volatility. And this is a complex question. We could see faster contagion and capital flow reversals, but CBDCs may also create new global safe assets. So it's really important that we look carefully and analyze different perspectives. And if these assets, these new assets, especially if they are uncorrelated, they could improve risk sharing and stability of the global financial system. At the same time, capital account restrictions may become harder or easier to implement depending on the design of digital money and regulation. So the responses to these questions are likely to depend on the design and features of the CBDCs. And from a policy perspective, it is important to think through carefully what the architecture and design allow CBDCs and whether um, they can improve global financial stability. So let's start the discussion with our first panelist, Marcus uh, Brunemeyer, professor from Princeton University. Marcus's research focuses on international financial markets and the macroeconomy. Marcus has made very important contributions. For example, he has coined the concept of digital currency areas, where the use of currency is linked to a particular digital network rather than a specific country. So Marcus, would CBDCs increase currency substitution and financial stability risks, especially in countries with weaker economic fundamentals. How should we think through these issues? Thanks a lot, Ashila. It's a pleasure to be with you and to be, have the opportunity to talk here at this forum. So I would like to change the 
the perspective a little bit. So there's a lot of debate in if we introduce CBDC, how will it change the stability of the international monetary system if we introduce it now? But I think what's really important to understand is that um, we will change the system anyway. So we should actually see what happens if we have a new system and we have it with CBDC or not with CBDC and how will the new world look like? So we will have a new world where you can much more easily switch across currencies. So the switching costs decline. And you know, the way it will be in the future is that you can just go in a store and in the augmented reality glasses from Google or Apple or whatever, uh, you can actually then see already the favorite currency, the, the prices in your favorite currency. So things will change a lot. So right now we all use essentially as a unit of account, we use the currency we're most familiar with in the future, the switching from one currency to another currency will be much more easy. And it will also, the lock-in effects we have right now, the frictions we have right now will go away. It's a little bit like if you look at translation software, right now we all speak in the same language in the same country, but in the future we can just communicate with different languages and then there's a translation software translating everything. So we are much less locked in in a common language within a country. That will be the case, we will be much less locked in in a particular currency. Now, in such a world, uh, things will be much faster moving and everything will be more dramatically switching back and forth. And it also limits the policy space for individual uh, central banks or also from the fiscal side. So the policy space is much more limited. And that's why, you know, the CBDC in this picture comes in. It can be actually a stabilizing force. And let me just go to financial stability issues uh, a little bit. So in a sense, there's always the danger once you have CBDC, it is the case that bank runs might be more likely because it's so easy to run from a particular bank in those central bank digital currency. But you can also easily run into another bank. And so why should you run in a particular CBDC compared to a very solid other bank? And I think what the advantage is, if people run into CBDC, actually they run into the central bank of the same country and the central bank of the country can then channel back the funds back to this particular bank. If the central bank fuse this bank solvent, then all the bank run will occur. If you don't have CBDC, then people might run into another currency because it's not much more easy to run in another currency. And then the system, the money leaves the country. And that's actually, in my view, much more dangerous than having a bank run on a particular institution where you can channel it back. Once you have a run away from a currency into another currency, it runs outside of the central bank um, of this particular central bank's uh, universe. And it's much easier to contain these dangers. So in particular, smaller emerging and developing economies, they will be threatened much more in the future by currency runs than by uh, bank runs. And hence having CBDC actually will channel, gives another outlet, gives another safe haven or safe asset, as you called, to run into. And that grants the central bank then the possibility to channel it back and stabilize certain banks which there are fewer solvent, others perhaps not, which they're, if they're insolvent, and that's very, very important. But the key here is the design of the CBDC to make it stable. And, you know, for example, the big design issues are, can non-residents hold CBDC or not? So that's a design issue for a country, but also for another country where you can turn into something. And will the other country, the foreign country, make non-residents allow to hold their CBDC? So you can run into this, other countries and there will be competition across CBDCs, much more forceful competitions and with respect to private currency stable coins. And if there's more regulation on this uh, stable coins, actually it will be the case that then uh, paradoxically, there will be seen as a better substitute for official currencies. So the more regulation there is on the stable coins, the more competitive there will be and the more likely will be a run from smaller emerging economies into these stable coins and potentially destabilizing them these countries, if they don't have an alternative, if they don't compete with their own solid CBC arrangement at home. Yeah, very good points, uh, um, Marcus. And, and really, um, I like the analogy to um, the Google translation. Hopefully, <laughs> we don't get lost in translation. And what you say very much makes sense in terms of the need for um, regulations and in terms of the design of the, um, uh, of the CBDCs to through these um, possible transmission channels and try to 
address them. And that uh, provides a very good segue to our second panelist, Nihar Nerula, who is the director of the Digital Currency Initiative at MIT. She has been involved in a research collaboration with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston on Project Hamilton, aiming to understand the technology trade-offs involved in a hypothetical digital dollar. And so, Niha, please tell us how should the CBDCs be designed to help improve the stability of the global uh, system along the lines of some of the um, uh, issues that uh, Marcus raised as concerns? Yeah, well, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I think we need to take a step back and think about CBDCs in the larger context of innovations in technology and finance. So CBDCs are one way of possibly improving the payments and financial flows, including financial stability, but they're not the only way. And it's not an either or situation. There will be many solutions deployed in tandem. Uh, for example, to improve inclusion, uh, faster payment systems might help lower costs, or there might be regulation to improve access to free or low cost digital financial services. One thing missing from the discourse is a very rigorous study of how these different solutions might compare and contrast in achieving our goals like stability. And part of the reason this comparison is missing is because one cannot simply refer to CBDC as a single coherent product or tool. Everyone who does make assumptions on how a hypothetical CBDC might work um, is, is, uh, is making assumptions. And these details matter quite a bit to how the CBDC is used. A specific design's efficacy to achieve its goals depends very much on specifics. And I'm sure that these decisions will be very different in different jurisdictions as well. So let's consider multiple solutions, uh, many of which might be deployed in a complementary fashion, including a range of approaches for how CBDCs might be designed. And we can think of these designs on a spectrum from approaches that uh, differ slightly from our existing system to designs that are a bit more radical. So for example, uh, on, the, on the end of designs that are sort of incremental changes over our existing system, we can think about regulation that might require commercial banks to provide free accounts or that might actually give more institutions, more financial institutions, access to a central bank's balance sheet. Uh, from there, we move down the spectrum to things like tokenized bank accounts, which is a, essentially what our stable coins are, uh, are sort of going down the path towards becoming. And uh, design further away in the realm of central bank digital currency uh, could take on many forms. Um, and one of those forms is something that we call digital cash. So something that is uh, uh, very accessible, very easy to use, um, and is peer to peer, transmitted person to person. Now, with all of these designs, it's important to evaluate trade-offs. Uh, and an example here, here's an example of a factor that is very important to think about, that of access. So who can access a CBDC, but more importantly, not just what the rules are or what we say about who can access a CBDC, but exactly how that access is mediated. So at a very fine-grained level, a very technical level, who actually is in the middle when a transaction happens on a CBDC? Who can prevent a transaction from happening or make it very difficult for an individual to make a payment in a CBDC? Um, because no matter what the rules say, you know, people are gonna use this in ways that we don't expect. And related to that question is what is required to onboard onto a CBDC. So many designs assume some form of digital identity, which um, in most of the world does not yet exist. And in many contexts, requiring some form of digital identity to use a CBDC could leave out the most economically disadvantaged. So there's still much work to be done here. Uh, in addition to that, lowering the barrier to transacting introduces security risks. So the more access there is, the more people who can access the system, the more risk malicious actors accessing the system. So, um, you know, if we want to achieve these goals of financial inclusion, we have to think about how can we design tools to mitigate entry to the CBDC without necessarily requiring high fees or, or strong forms of identity. Another important area to think about, another factor of design, is that of data visibility and retention. Uh, if privacy from the central bank itself is not taken seriously as a first order concern, then the door is open for rogue states to use CBDC as a form of monitoring and enforcement against their own citizens. And what's very interesting here, I think, is that first movers have inordinate influence in setting norms and standards. So China's ECNY, for example, is already setting a specific type of expectation that the central bank will not store user data, but 
that that data, which is stored at commercial banks, can easily be aggregated uh, and could be accessed by the government. Uh, it's interesting to note as well that designs which really reduce the amount of data stored at the central bank introduce other risks in terms of recovery and auditing and also access to the system. Uh, so, you know, I want to point out that these questions that I've just raised are not actually connected to the typical debate we've been having about whether the data model is tokens or accounts or whether you use DLT or not. I think we've really gone beyond this simplistic framing. And I'll also add that if CBDC is designed to look very close to the system we have today, where perhaps the only notable difference is that it's a central bank liability, it's hard to see how there'll be as much potential for impact. Uh, if the public still has to conduct digital payments primarily through commercial banks and commercial bank accounts, it, it seems like it would, it would be very close to the system of walled gardens that we have today. We have an opportunity to create something better with 24-7 availability. Um, strong data privacy, secure offline transactions, and um, a platform for innovation with programmable money. Uh, so designing a new system, uh, keeping in mind our public policy goals, might look quite different than what we have today. And that implies there'll be a greater likelihood of effects, um, including risks, but also a greater likelihood of achieving benefit. And I want to point out that even if we are unsure of what effects a, a new CBD design might have, not doing anything at all might affect inter the international monetary and financial system even more. Uh, money is changing, technology is changing, and it's going to move forward uh, whether or not central banks consider also evolving their system. So we have to evolve with it. Thank you. These are um, excellent comments, both technical as well as um, what you alluded to at the end, which is um, this is going to happen and it's better to um, coordinate and innovate in a way which makes the most use of them um, rather than uh, trying to trying to prevent this. But, no, the very important points, and I would like to come back to some of the key issues that you raised, but we now have uh, Hyun uh, Song Shin, who joined us. He had some technical issues, but now he's on board, which is great. Hyun is the economic advisor and head of research at the Bank for International Settlements, had a very distinguished academic career, and is a thought leader in the areas of banking, international finance, and monetary economics and is currently leading the research program on digital innovation and the financial system, including CBDCs. So Hyun, you just joined us. I wanted to ask you, building up on what Marcus said and um, what we heard from Niha just now, what, what do you think would be the effects of CBDCs on capital flows and volatility and ultimately the economic impact? And how should we think about some of the issues that uh, Niha raised in terms of the design features that would allow us to address these risks? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Jayla. Thank you for uh, the, the invitation to, to join this great panel. Um, I think the design issues are absolutely key um, in, in how they will function and what kind of effects uh, they will have on the economy. I think, broadly speaking, there are there are two forks in the road, if you like, um, in the in the design of a CBDC. Uh, one fork is the choice of whether you, uh, you know, the operational architecture. Do you do you have a central um, uh, intermediary, uh, namely the central bank, that uh, that keeps track of the transactions uh, and ensures integrity and finality, or is it based on a decentralized governance system uh, based on DLT or blockchain, if you like, where the validity of payments depends on achieving consensus uh, among network participants. Now, um, and the second uh, fork in the road, uh, uh, perhaps even more important, is whether the uh, access um, happens around the verification of personal uh, of personal identity, so some some notion of uh, ID being central, or whether it's uh, uh, done through um, uh, you know like cash some. A verification of the validity of the object being traded um, or with let's say public key cryptography uh, as is done with uh, as is done with bitcoin and i think by now central banks have a pretty good idea uh, of um, uh, the kinds of design that will work best and to cut a long story short i think we're coming to the view that uh, some combination of um, a verifiable id um, combined with um, a uh, certainly for retail CBDC, uh, more of a centralized ledger 
uh, they can really handle the volume of payments that, that, that you would expect um, with, a, with a general purpose uh, CBDC. It's, of course, different for wholesale, um, where there are fewer uh, you know, uh, in a market participants, uh, although the, the amounts are larger. Um, so when we think about the implications of CBDC for capital flows, for currency substitution, uh, and, uh, and international spillovers, um, the idea of CBDC being analogous to, you know, wads of cash in briefcases, uh, you know, circulating in a black market, that's probably not the right analogy when we think about CBDC, um, because most realistic designs rely on a two-tier system uh, where there is, um, you know, good onboarding and, uh, and due diligence based on, uh, based on personal ID. And what that means is that uh, the, the central bank will have a say on who has access to the CBDC, um, uh, although there are some variations in the design as to whether the central bank, you know, keeps a copy or ledger, uh, uh, you know, centrally. But, um, um, but irrespective of that, the, the central bank will have some say on who has access. And so the use of uh, one country CBDC outside that uh, jurisdiction will, to, uh, to a large extent, be under the control of the central bank. And I think what that means is uh, monetary cooperation will be key. Some notion of the mutual recognition of digital ID is going to be key for cross-border payments. Um, but I think the, uh, the, uh, the kind of um, uh, you know, extreme cases of currency substitution whereby you can have a foreign CBDC encroach and uh, actually displace uh, your, your, your home currency. I think that's probably not the right kind of picture. Thanks for this, Hun. I want to turn back to Niha and see if um, she has any comments on what we just heard from Hun in terms of the, uh, the most likely system that the central banks have been uh, discussing, both in terms of the um, operational architecture and the access. Just to uh, get your views, Niha, on this quickly before we move to the second broad topic. Uh, certainly, sure. So I, I think there's probably what we hope will happen, and then uh, there's reality, which might end up being a bit different than what we expect. Um, I, I do think it's it's challenging to rely on notions of digital identity, especially when most of the world does not necessarily have a strong digital identity or inclusive digital identity framework implemented. Uh, and, and in the places in the world where it is implemented, we're still understanding what type of effect it has on who is included and who is not included. So I think that this will probably pre be pretty challenging in practice um, and that we're going to have to look very carefully at how digital identity is implemented, how digital identity requirements might affect financial inclusion in particular, given even in the United States, uh, how many people do not have uh, certain forms of identity that we might expect them to have. Uh, and in addition to that, if if we are going down a path that considers things like strong digital identity, how that data is stored, who has access to that data, what happens when those data stores are breached, because it will happen. Um, uh, you know, these are sort of, you know, very important practical considerations to consider. And so I think we probably need to go further down the path of implementation and design in order to understand if these, uh, if these high level approaches are going to be viable in practice. Well, very good point. And I know our colleagues across the street, World Bank has been working on, um, ID for development, and there was um, very good collaboration both with the private sector and the public sector to address some of the issues you just mentioned. Because as, as uh, we know, some countries have made progress, um, uh, like India with Aadhaar and so on, but then there are many parts of the world that uh, do not have a digital ID in place. So really, as you say, this will have implications um, in terms of inclusion within and across countries. So let's talk about the second broad topic, and that's b basically whether CBDCs would lead to a reconfiguration of the international currencies and the global financial safety net. For us, um, as uh, a key part at the center of the global financial safety net, this is of course very important. It has been argued that introducing a CBDC sooner rather than later could give rise to a significant first mover advantage to its issue. You just mentioned it as well, Niha. Um, moreover, CBDC competition may differ from traditional currency competition, as Kuhn mentioned, by differentiating along associated networks and users rather than being based on macroeconomic performance. So 
This, of course, would um, alter the traditional drivers of international currency configurations. And for central banks that decide to use CBDCs, this uh, may cause, um, uh, in some cases, help their currencies to internationalize or achieve reserve uh, currency status and could help uh, new currencies overcome some of the advantages of incumbent dominant currencies. So intense competition between a few major CBDCs could provide the uh, backdrop of an emergence of a multilateral, multipolar world and throughout history, transitions from one dominant international currency to another year took anywhere from several years to many decades. And the transition process has often led to a lot of uncertainty, sometimes turmoil, and even crisis. So how would the transition from the current international monetary and financial system without CBDCs would look like um, uh, in the future with uh, CBDCs? So, um, what are the opportunities we face? What are the risks? And when a few CBDCs become widely adopted, how do we make sure that coordination can be in place to make sure that we don't have instability as investors substitute from one reserve asset to another, as we just discussed? So let's talk about how um, dominant CBDCs, multiple dominant CBDCs could fragment established funding markets and official liquidity support mechanisms. And um, I would like each of your views on what are the factors that we should be thinking about as we adopt uh, CBDCs, and how do we make sure that we avoid a multipolar international monetary and financial system, um, and how do we manage the transition? So let's start with Marcus, please, and then I'd like to go to, our, uh, to uh, Niha and Huyen. Thanks, Sheila. That's a fascinating question. I think it refers also to this concept of digital dollarization or reminization or euroization. And I think what's really important here is to you can have an offensive move or a defensive move. And then, you know, for example, whether you design CBDCs to be allowed by non-residents, not as uh, was mentioned before, how you can onboard on CBDCs is very crucial, but it's not your own CBDC, but it's the foreign CBDC which can actually change that. And I think this, there will be many new digital currency areas evolving. There will be some private and some will be public. And I think rather than the CBDC itself, which I think is very important, but the private institutions, the private currencies, you know, which rely on a backing by CBDC will be more important. So rather than focusing only on CBDC, I think what's really important to establish uh, a new global currency is the global lender of last resort feature. To what extent does the central bank offer directly or indirectly a lender of last resort feature to private currencies, which are then denominated in this particular unit of account? So if you want to maintain monetary sovereignty, it's all about maintaining the unit of account role of money. And the unit of account role of money, you can defend it by having a more powerful lender of last resort feature. So people and banks will then issue deposits or private entities, could be big tech companies, issue deposits in the form of this unit of account. If there are no, there's more regulation, there's smarter regulation, and there will be some backing in the form of a lender of last resort. Of course, the central bank has to take a certain counterparty risk, but if there's smart regulation, I think that currency will have an edge over the other currencies. So paradoxically, if you have more regulation or smart regulation, you have a bigger chance of, uh, of, being taking, uh, of taking a larger share of the international uh, capital market. So what, what, it, what really required is uh, some elasticity of the currency, also extended to the digital space uh, as well. And CBDC will be the contributing factor, but I think it's not the decisive factor. Overall, what we will see, and you alluded to that, we will see crisis becoming way faster than historically because everything will move much, much faster. And if we have to have, we have to have a system, it might be useful to have CDC because you can respond faster as well. So the private sector crisis will move faster. So you have to have a setup from the official sector, which can also respond very quickly and very fast. And then that's important uh, to have. Whether this will be then a multipolar or a unipolar system, that still depends on the different regulation, but I would not only focus on CBDC, I would take 
broader perspective on this because I think very the other elements are probably at least as important as the CBDC components to that. And uh, finally, then the transition phase, as you mentioned, if we move to a different setting, the transition phases are always loaded with uh, financial instability risks. And that's what we have to watch out how the transition that will happen uh, if we make this transition. And that you know depends again on the ultimate policy decisions by the various countries, whether they're offensive or defensive, and um, uh, how the transition will be organized by the other countries who there will be part of a multipolar arrangement if this ever happens to become this way. Niha, over to you. Thanks, Marcus. And you mentioned more and smart regulation, um, that, that this would uh, allow one country to um, have an edge over, uh, central banks to have an edge over other currencies and be able to take um, larger share of the of the capital markets. So what do you think, Niha? What, how, how should we think about this um, more and smart regulation? What are other issues that you think we need to uh, focus on? Yeah, so, so I think there's there's two important um, factors to think about, is, and especially thinking about what we can learn from what's happened in technology in the past. Uh, the first is, as Marcus was speaking about, speed. Uh, so technology has a way of creating unforeseen side effects and changes at wide scale and with rapid speed. And we've seen examples of this, um, for example, in uh, the trading world with algorithmic trading in high frequency trading and sort of the interesting effects that speed has brought on uh, in, with, you know, in, in enabling certain risks and in these markets. Um, the other, uh, the other um, area I think that we need to think about is, is standards. So, um, you know, we talk about first mover advantage a lot, and it's actually very interesting because in technology, it can certainly be possible to be too early to, uh, to develop a product that the world is just not ready to receive or the infrastructure isn't in place to make that product as successful as it could be. So sometimes the first mover doesn't always win. Sometimes they're too early. Um, but I think that it's not just about the first mover effect for adoption. It's also about the first mover effect for standards. So uh, whoever's first out of the gate here is going to set norms and standards um, around uh, uh, what around privacy, around how open the system is, um, and, uh, and, and actually very detailed standards in, in how transactions are formatted and, and how they interact. Um, and as you know, financial institutions start onboarding onto these systems, they're going to get used to one set of standards. And it's going to be uh, extra work to add in new sets of standards. So I think these are the really two key features to think about here. Um, how speed uh, and an improved speed is going to end up affecting uh, what is usually the most cumbersome leg of a transaction, which is the cash leg of a transaction, and then um, standard setting and how the first mover might have an effect in setting standards and expectations. Very, very good points. And uh, there's a lot of debate, of course, in the international fora at the G7, at the G20, um, at the uh, BIS, of course. So, Huyun, um, can you tell us your views on, in particular, standards and, um, and what uh, Marcus termed as more and smart regulation? Yeah, um, I think uh, more and smart regulation is certainly going to be part of this. But let me go back to your your um, your high level question, which is uh, you know which was all about uh, you know which was about um, the you know the multipolar nature of the monetary system um, and uh, um, and the uh, and the emergence of uh, um, you know vehicle currencies and so on. I think if we take a long perspective, Jayla, um, uh, I think what we can see is that uh, money or the payment system itself doesn't really exist in a vacuum uh, that's separate from the underlying economic relationship. So uh, in a way, that's a that's a sort of fairly sort of basic point. But I think um, uh, we probably underestimate the extent to which uh, you know economic transactions weave uh, this web of you know long-term relationships between. You know, between individuals as suppliers, intermediaries, uh, you know, or as customers, and this web of uh, you know relationships really uh, is the is the underpinning for uh, you know for the financial system itself. And if we think about how cross-border payments actually arose, um, and Isabel Schnabel and I wrote pa uh, wrote a paper uh, about cross-border payments in Europe in the 18th century, you know, surrounding the bills of exchange, and there. Uh, the payment system was also a credit system because 
the bills of exchange were discounted along the chain and allowed merchants in the chain to finance their working capital. And deposits really came much later, um, as some of the merchants took in deposits to settle maturing bills. And so, so in this respect, the bankers of the day were also merchants, and hence the, the origin of the term merchant banker. Um, so why do I point to this? I think it's important that um, these long-standing relationships are really important in generating that trust and, uh, and uh, if you like, the relationship-specific um, collateral uh, that really underpins uh, uh, the fact that you can actually make promises. So um, just by virtue of technology, just by virtue of being able to issue a currency in digital form, of course, you know, that's going to have an effect at the margin. Uh, but that's not going to fundamentally change, you know, the rationale for the need to make the payments, you know, along that chain, as it were. So I think, you know, when we think about the the global implications uh, of the adoption of CBDCs across jurisdictions, um, I think the um, keeping pace, if you like, uh, the financial system and the payment system, keeping pace with the underlying economic transactions, this will probably be, be a you know very important part of our thinking, and and clearly. Being able to set standards is going to be absolutely key, and uh, because of the coordination nature of the uh, you know the network nature of of standards, uh, you know that could uh, take a lot longer than than uh, than you know we may think. Uh, you know at least in terms of theory. Yeah, very much so. I want to go back to one point that that's raised. Um, Marcus started talking about it, and and that's. Um, we have CBDCs, but we also have other forms of um, uh, digital assets, digital currencies. Some of you mentioned already the Bitcoin and so on. So I'd like to ask you each to, to please talk about how th this, of course, complicates the um, landscape when you have uh, other forms of um, uh, stable coins or, or digital assets. How, how should we think through the interaction? and transmission mechanisms that uh, do impact both in terms of um, uh, the safety and, and, and the risks and opportunities that uh, CBDCs can uh, provide going forward. So how, how should we, what are the complexities and challenges of these different, um, let's call them assets and, and uh, stable coins? You want to start, Tim? So should I jump in? Or? Yes, please, Marcus. So essentially, it depends uh, to what extent I can imagine that there will be a lot of uh, private currency and coins, which will be highly regulated. And then there can be, to a degree, convertible to CBDC. And if this is the case, you can extend the room of uh, your currency quite a lot. So essentially, it is the interaction between private coins and CBDC, which will make uh, the whole uh, setting different. And as I mentioned earlier, that's where the lender, global lender of last resort comes in. Does the central bank want to do that? Want to extend some guarantee to some private coins or not? By doing so, it will, and if this stable coin is denominated in the home unit of account, it can in increase its visibility, its influence at a global scale, but it also takes on some uh, currency risk and it takes uh, some uh, some uh, default risk or counterparty risk. And that's that's a big decision all of the various players have to make. And but if you that's for the large countries, but if for the smaller countries, they can see this as a threat. And that's why they would like to design their own CBDC as a defense mechanism and not allow their own current their own citizens mold this foreign uh, stable coins or might limit their activity in the stable coins. And I think that's where CBDC will be an important element <clears throat> in a bigger design issue, uh, but it's only a small part of it, but it will be some core element where they go get, this is our safety, this guarantees our, our unit of account, and CBDC will help us either to defend our own unit of account, or also in an offensive way, go into some other countries and expand the influence of our unit of account. And that's the decision uh, every nation has to make. And there will be new digital currency areas evolving. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, privacy plays an important role. So if you protect certain privacy, there will be certain currencies which are very you know, focused on protecting privacy and certain people will focus and like to use these particular private currencies. Others don't care so much and they are rather have a higher return on their currency. They will go for that and there will be some currencies 
focusing on the medium of exchange role and other currencies on the store of value. So there will be a lot of uh, things, but what is then ultimately anchored to the official currencies and who will anchor them and what risk they are willing to take and how they will regulate them, that should be part of the whole picture. And that will determine then which unit of account will take a bigger role in the global scene uh, and which one will not take a bigger role. Very much so. And we had um, we did a survey of our member countries, and 141 countries said they are in some spectrum of um, either uh, establishing or thinking about how they should position themselves the CBDCs, and one of the key questions, of course, was how does this fit in the broader scheme, uh, broader, um, uh, you know, c configuration of different types of private coins versus um, CBDCs. So really um, grappling with trying to understand, as you said, what would be the implications on the lender of last resort role and um, regulations more broadly, implications for privacy, implications for AML, CFD, anti-money laundering and uh, uh, regulations and so on. So really um, complex set of issues and um, what, what makes it also very difficult is the uncertainty uh, because there are different countries at, at different stages of, um, of the process and that creates, of course, um, both coordination issues but also difficulties in terms of, of design. I'd like to give the floor to uh, Hyun and then Niha on, on these uh, same issues. Uh, over to you, Hyun. Thank you, Jayla. Um, let me pick up on one, uh, I think one very important uh, theme, which is um, uh, the, you know, the role of CBDCs within the broad, um, within the broad perspective of financial innovation that will, you know, benefit users. And I think we should not underestimate the, um, the huge advantage we've made in, a con in, um, in the conventional payment system as well, especially through the, the retail fast payment system. And here, the perhaps the the biggest uh, the biggest advances have been uh, seen in the emerging markets, uh, where they are uh, you know not held back by legacy systems, uh, you know where um, you know there is a great deal of uh, of impetus to these innovations. And I think India is a very good example. I mean, you mentioned Ada Jaila, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the digital AI system in India, but UPI, which is the retail fast payment system. I think in in many ways embodies uh, you know some of the you know the best principles of an open architecture, where um, you know if you want to be a member of the system you have to play by the rules in terms of uh, um, uh, the interoperability requirements across different platforms, and uh, the UPI system in India is just one example of uh, of a of a recent spate of uh, retail fast payment systems that really embody the spirit and. The, the PIC system in Brazil is another very uh, a good example where, you know, it's been up and running since last November, uh, but they've already signed up uh, roughly two thirds of the population, uh, you know, less so in terms of volumes, but uh, a very large user base. Now, why, why are these uh, innovations really important? Well, I think it's because the way that it's structured, uh, the architecture is in terms of an open architecture where um, uh, it, uh, there are requirements for uh, ownership of data by the users. There are uh, application programming interfaces that make sure that interoperability is ensured between the, the uh, payment service providers. And what that means is that um, you achieve both, um, you know, uh, uh, preventing this walled garden phenomenon uh, where you have proprietary networks, you know, really dominating, while at the same time, uh, you know, lowering costs and, uh, uh, and uh, I think financial inclusion. And I think it's important to note that if you have something like retail fast payment system, you are pretty much, I, I would say, 70% of the way there towards a CBDC. Uh, you know, you have a retail fast payment system. Well, if you have a retail fast payment system, what you, what you already have is a digital ID uh, infrastructure that you can draw on. You have the, um, uh, the cryptographic systems up, in play, you know, um, up and running that will ensure um, a high level of um, you know, security and privacy you know, for, the, for the individual users. And these are exactly the kind of features you will need if you want to roll out a full-fledged you know, CBDC that uh, will enhance financial inclusion. Now, 
Um, you're not quite there uh, to CBDC because uh, it's still a two-tier system where uh, users have claims on intermediaries rather than the central bank directly. Um, so the, if you like, the leap from a retail fast payment system like PIX or UPI to a retail CBDC, that's really uh, more of an evolutionary step rather than something which is radically different. I think we are you know, uh, building on a lot of the information infrastructure uh, that you know you will need to have this open architecture. So I think, in that sense, um, your progress has already been made, and um, I think the impact is already being felt. Um, but it's a very um, uh, you know it's a very rich ecosystem out there uh, with a lot of different players you know jostling for for attention. And uh, you know I've just come back from I've just come from a, our own event uh, on big tech and finance, and I think the the entry of big techs. Uh, is going to be probably the most uh, you know interesting and important issue for us to ponder you know as central bankers as uh, policymakers uh, you know in this uh, you know a very important area. If the big tech is also a stable coin uh, you know with its own ecosystem, what that means is that then you could also have the ecosystem being propped up uh, on its own money, uh, and then you have to face these uh, even bigger issues that Marcus knows very well. Uh, about the fragmentation of the monetary system and so on. But let me uh, just stop there, Jayla, without going on too long. No, very, very good points, Hyun. On your last point, and linking back to what you said about the uh, cross-border payments in Europe and the merchant bankers, I think um, th what does uh, big tech mean in terms of the, the financial sector architecture? What does it mean for the banking sector? And how would that then... Um, uh, have, what would be the implications on the lender of last resort role of the central bank are a really key question. So I would really like to hear from Niha first and then turn to... Uh, so Jayla, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, the, uh, the video feed just cut out for a second. Um, so I think your question was on what would the entry of big techs imply for the banking sector, is that right? Yes, so I was just saying that I was linking this to what you talked about uh, earlier on the cross-border payments in, in Europe and merchant bankers, and that the big techs uh, in this space, what would be the implications for the financial sector landscape, uh, implications for commercial banks, and of course, relating to the topic we are discussing today, lender of last resort, both domestically and globally. So what I was going to, what I'm saying, thing is I turn to Niha first about uh, broader points on what we have been discussing and would like to then turn to um, you and, and Marcus on how do we think about the role of big tech and, and the implications on, um, on financial stability in particular. So that's the next question for the three of you. But uh, Niha, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Shayla. Um, so I, I think uh, sort of two points uh, I want to make on this topic of smart regulation and sort of how to think about regulating these new things. Uh, so first of all, I, I think we know quite a bit about the financial risks with some of those new technologies. So, um, you know, is it for, with stable coins, for example, is the stable coin fully backed? Uh, what is it backed by? and what might the risk be if that stablecoin needs to be unwound at a very high speed, if there's a large number of redemptions, what could that do to certain markets? Um, what I haven't heard as much conversation about, which concerns me a little bit, is the new technical risk introduced by this technology. So I think it's important to note that um, stablecoins do not operate on traditional financial infrastructure. Uh, they operate on top of public blockchain uh, public decentralized networks. This is very new financial infrastructure uh, that has only existed uh, in some cases for you know, even less than a year with some of these new networks. And what we're seeing is these stable coins are growing larger and larger and larger on these networks. And people are very focused on the financial risk, but they don't necessarily understand all the ways in which um, you know, these networks might be attacked or there might be um, you know, risk with keys getting compromised or you know, there might be concern about blockchains getting uh, rewritten or confusion about which is, the, which is the actual blockchain in some of these networks. So I think um, this is something that, uh, that we need to start to begin to discuss and this is going to require a pretty new skill set um, in organizations like yours, uh, uh, where um, you know you have the ability to understand the risks inherent in these different blockchain networks, especially the newer ones, um, and to advise 
these emerging markets in particular, who are, um, you know, what I've been noticing is that a lot of these networks are approaching small countries and offering to do pilots. So, um, you know, understanding these risks and understanding uh, what that might in entail, I think, is going to require a new type of um, a knowledge in in the uh, global financial system. Um, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pause there. I, on the notion of big tech, I think um, I'm very interested to hear uh, what Marcus and you have to say. Yeah, very good points, Anna. and um, network networks inter interlinkages among networks and potential spillovers and risks among ne networks are also very important. And I don't think we have a good understanding of that either. And um, very much take the point that we, as an institution, also up need to upgrade um, our skills, understanding better some of these issues and um, some of the concepts on network spillovers and interlinkages that we really looked at a lot in the past. How, what, how do these uh, change uh, in this new uh, framework? It's going to be really critical. So, Marcus, your thoughts on, on this issue, which is a very important one, as well as um, on uh, the role of big, big tech and how we need to think through it. So I agree with uh, Nia that there's a lot of operational risk as well in the private currencies. And, uh, and that's actually one of the handicaps that these uh, you know, new currencies have. And they probably would like to have some regulation and some stamp from the official authorities. You know, this is actually working well. And there has to be some expertise developed in-house within the fund and also within national central banks and so forth to, to grant the stamp. But of course, by granting a stamp, you also implicitly count a certain form of uh, a support, so in crisis support, and that's will then establish certain stable coins more than other stable coins. And uh, that can, you know, make certain stable coins more attractive or less attractive. And I think that's one has to be careful as well to what extent one wants to bring them in the room. And if he wants, wants to bring them in the room of regulation very tightly, uh, then they will be more attractive. It's a little bit like, you know, if you look at the money market funds, they have um, a certain regulation, they have this breaking the buck rule, and because of the breaking the buck rule, they can advertise that, you know, we have actually a breaking the buck rule and they can attract then more investors. And this way, then at the end of the day, you have to provide an implicit guarantee as well. So one has to keep these uh, considerations uh, very well into account, uh, take them into account as well. Uh, but in the bigger room of things, I agree that, you know, there's a huge operational risk in this space. And that's, again, why it's also necessary. And it will be very fast, as I uh, pointed out as well. And you have to have some fallback option. And for this, CBDC would be the fallback option to have a stable core in the digital uh, arena. And that's why I think there's probably, especially for smaller countries, there's no other opportunity, no other way to go than to have their own CBDC. Overall, just a final thought I would like to convey, and I agree with Hyun that, you know, the existing banking system has done uh, some good advancements, but there's so much more to be done. And there's so many more inefficiency in the banking system. If you look at the number of unbanked people, if you look at how long it takes to make an international transaction. So there's so much more to improve on that. And I think that we should be grateful, you know, there's innovation, but any innovation, you know, initially comes with certain risks. So we have to contain this risk, but I wouldn't shy away from saying we should actually stop this or slow it down. I think it is actually important uh, that uh, the innovation is keep, keeps going and then we can improve the situation in particular for the poor people who are unbanked and um, don't have the access to what's really needed to thrive in our society. Hyun. What are your thoughts? Yes, Janice, so let me uh, address your question earlier about the implications uh, of the entry of big techs into, uh, into finance uh, for the banking system. And uh, as we well know, um, the business model of big techs is, is built around uh, data, uh, data that's generated from the direct interaction um, of users in, the, uh, in their various uh, business lines, uh, social media, e-commerce, et cetera. And this interaction gives rise to network effects where uh, the more users flock to a particular platform, uh, the more other users are attracted to that platform. And so you, we, we have this sort of um, this snowballing effect. Um, and um, what this means is that um, uh, these network effects 
uh, can enable very rapid growth of uh, of big tech platforms uh, in finance. And the and the two uh, big payment uh, providers in China, I think, is a very good example. Where you know, ten years ago, uh, they were really nowhere to be seen. Um, they were very small, uh, but uh, but but within a space of a few years, they have a ninety four percent market share in digital payments. Now, what does this mean for the banking system? Well, the banks, of course, um, have a tremendous uh, have tremendous advantages in terms of um, uh, a, a loyal depositor ba uh, base. They have soft information on the borrowers, good relationships, very high, um, uh, uh, you know, very high reputation, um, reputational capital, if you like. Um, I think what you know, one issue is that deposits uh, have. Uh, you know, this dual character. You know, on the one hand, it's a payments medium uh, where you debit the account of the payer, you credit the account of the receiver. But on the other hand, it's also a way of uh, a funding source. It's a way of funding, uh, you know, lending. And historically, uh, you know, this uh, this combination of roles has has grown together. And Marcus, in some of his earlier papers, has talked about you know unbundling. Uh, you know some of this, but I think it's you know that unbundling is going to be uh, you know probably a long drawn out affair. Now I think the issue is that um, the kinds of informational advantages that uh, that banks have are being quickly overtaken by you know big data and uh, uh, and being able to pass that data with uh, uh, with AI and machine learning and so on. To the extent that big tech companies have, if you like, um, entered into partnerships. With banks, where uh, the big tech firms that provide, if you like, the credit analysis, um, but then the banks provide the funding. And I think that kind of partnership, you know, we have seen in some jurisdictions, um, probably means that you know that comparative advantage that that banks used to have uh, is probably less so these days. And I think so. You know, when we apply um, uh, you know competition rules to the banking sector and data privacy rules. I think this is the kind of thing we should, uh, you know, bear in mind because, as you say, there are broader financial stability implications uh, of uh, you know, the banking sector in some way being displaced. Um, but I think, you know, we should be, um, you know, we should think of this more in the in the holistic context of how will the financial system look like, how will that constellation look like, yeah, um, uh, you know, rather than sort of thinking about. Uh, um, the banking system and the sort of two-tier payment system, as as it were, being a kind of, you know, uh, you know, high state of uh, you know, the, the 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 kind of you know epitome uh, of the financial system from which there could be no more progress. I think we should be you know open to um, you know thinking about uh, a reconfiguration as well. Mm -hmm. And as Mark said, it's very important that um, uh, the banking sector, that you know, the banks themselves use this as a, as an opportunity to raise their game. Thank you for that. Um, I very much agreed. And I think this was a really fascinating discussion and a very good um, points were raised. Um, I, uh, it really underscores the need uh, for us to engage more with yourselves as we think through what this means for conduct of monetary policy, conduct of um, macroprudential policies, um, capital account management issues, and, and very much uh, important for us at the fund, what does it mean for the, how the financial system will look like, how the international monetary system will look like. So many um, issues, and this was really a great way to um, go into more deeper some of the design issues. I really appreciated um, many of the issues that you raised and uh, learned a lot as well and look forward to continued discussion. Thank you very much uh, to all of you and, uh, and look forward to continued uh, engagement. Thanks again.